So my name is Stefan Ludwig. I am a wedding photographer and videographer here in Buffalo, New York. And today my guest is Andy Buscemi, also a local photographer. So Andy, what do you do? I take photos. I take a lot of photos. I take mostly wedding photos. And uh, it's my full-time full -time gig. Um, between about 30 weddings a year. Uh, and then I get some, you know, additional stuff on the side here and there. I've been doing the, the Lilac Festival out in Rochester. Um, most of my work is, you know, between Buffalo and Rochester. And then I have a few weddings a year where I get to go to cool places. Um, so. Like what? Um, so I just had an engagement shoot in Los Angeles. Um, and I have that wedding uh, coming up in December for a wedding out in Los Angeles. And I uh, have like, like a wedding in Maine. I had one in Connecticut last year. Um, so I get a few a year where people will um, bring me places. But I'm mostly, I would say, 80% to 85% of my work is in Buffalo and Rochester. And I go back and forth between the two. And I actually, I kind of um, like it that way. Uh, just because the, whenever you do have a wedding where somebody brings you somewhere, there's a lot more work involved, a lot more scouting. You have to arrive early. You have to make sure the plane gets there a few days ahead of time because you, know, you don't want to mess with somebody's uh, wedding. So it just ends up being a lot more work for, for usually about the same amount of money, even when you do build, build in travel expenses. Um, so you know, I'm happy uh, just kind of doing my thing here between Buffalo and Rochester. Um, and living a good life. I mean, I think it's, you're always living a good life. If you can make a living doing something you love, uh, you know, and I love what I do, I consider myself extremely fortunate uh, to do what I do. So, Cool. So you were a teacher before. So tell me about that transition, how you became a photographer. Yeah. So I was a music teacher for eight years. Uh, I went to school for music to teach music. I was a middle school and high school vocal music director. And around 2009, 2010, when all of the uh, budget cuts started happening in this particular you know, area, uh, I saw my position get cut in half. And I was already kind of photographing at the time. And uh, so essentially what I did is I, I figured, well, I, you only live once. I'm going to try and make a go at this thing. Uh, I was super addicted to listening to photography podcasts and learning from the best there are like if you everything's on youtube nowadays so if you go on youtube you can pretty much learn whatever it is you want to learn and this and in 2009 2010 that was already happening and i was pretty much doing that uh, non-stop when i was uh, when i was teaching and i transitioned i had a really easy transition where i think a lot of people don't have an easy transition where i was a half-time teacher and a half and i had about a half-time worth of photography business um, the year that my position went from full-time to half-time and then the following year they cut the position and by that point I was I was booking about 30 weddings I was a little underpriced for the market in order to do that um, but it was the smart thing for me to do in order to build up that initial uh, client base and it I had a full-time business by the following year so I was it was a fairly easy transition and I was very lucky the way that happened cool um, yeah you just mentioned podcasts and like learning on YouTube, which is pretty much what I did. Um, now you have your own podcast. Want to tell a little bit about that? What's like, what's your goal with like you doing that with Neil Urban, another local photographer? Yeah. So the, the podcast I do with uh, Neil Urban, who is a unbelievably fantastic photographer. Uh, he, you know, he's a, he's earned his master's from WPPI, which um, has taken a number of years to do. And it doesn't just happen easily. I think he's an exceptional photographer. Um, so, you know, I approached Neil a few years ago about uh, starting a podcast with him. Um, and the way that I see it, uh, I think some people are a little bit worried about putting everything out there because, you know, well, well what if somebody so and so uh, steals the way that I run my, my business or whatever. But the reality is, is like I just mentioned before, everything's already out there on, on YouTube and all these different places. So I think that was an older concern, you know, like back in the day, you know, before the, the advent of the internet. And uh, so the way I see it is, is by doing it, Neil and I have really grown a lot as photographers because we're interviewing other people. You sometimes learn best by teaching. And so if you're teaching, uh, you, you have to know it doubly or triply as well as you would if you were just doing it, right? You learn as, as you teach. So that was kind of part of it. 
And, and the way I see it is, is we've both grown a lot and kind of identified ourselves as people that are, you know, teaching and, and leaders and all that. And that's kind of what you want, you know? So it's like, um, and also I'm thinking long term, to be honest, too. Uh, when I'm 60, do I want to be rolling around on the church floor taking wedding photographs? And if I can and I'm so healthy, sure, I would love it. But what if I'm not? And so it's like I, want to, I wanted to kind of build up a little bit of a network um, on more than just our, where we are here in this part of the world. The, the Internet is an amazing tool for getting out to the rest of the world. So um, that was that aspect, too. And now we have you know, friends from all over the world because of the podcast. And, and it's, uh, it's done what, it, what I've hoped that it would do. And it's, and it's and in terms of learning and growing. So it's been a great experience. Cool. Yeah. So is there any particular reason why you chose weddings or? Um, honestly, I think if I wanted to, if you want to make a living as a photographer, that's probably one of the easiest ways to do it. And, and I happen to love people. I know a lot of commercial photographers hate weddings, they want nothing to do with it. And generally speaking, that's because um, you really have to be a people person in order to enjoy weddings. And I really like people, I really enjoy talking to people, I really enjoy helping people, helping people feel comfortable. Like, like there's a big psychology factor that goes into um, being a wedding photographer. And uh, so I enjoy that. And and because I enjoy that and I enjoy photography, it's sure, I'll combine those aspects and it, it's great, you know. Um, I probably like that more than anything because the, the, the couples that I'm working with generally and like really enjoy working with me. I really enjoy working with them. I found that the commercial work that I get um, when I do get that, it ends up being more stressful in terms of pricing it out, more stressful in terms of having somebody look over your shoulder when you're shooting. Um, you know, a little bit more critical and a little bit more um, when less invested. I think, you know, businesses are less invested in the, the product of photography that they're receiving because it's not them. But when it's, when it's them, when it's a couple who's invested in their wedding day and love and their family and their people, um, they're more emotionally invested in what they're receiving back and they end up loving the work and loving you more, you know, um, and then giving more. It's just so I just enjoy it better. I, maybe it's because I want my ego stroked a little bit more or something like that. But but it's uh, <laughs> but it works for me. And I really I really enjoy doing it. And uh, as far as as far as it all goes. So, yeah, yeah, I can see that I did a commercial shoot. I was assisting last week and we pretty much just, you know, photographed this boring looking machine that looked like a big table. <laughs> right. And then it's, I, I mean, I, I enjoyed it to like see how that works and you know, how much criticism you get from them. Where, you know, you like show like we were shooting tethered, so, so we were showing them what we got and they're like, okay, hey, move this slightly, can we move this? What about this like yellow thing in the back? We need that. Right. So there's like a lot of stuff to it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I mean, I could see myself doing that occasionally, but I don't want to like, only shoot something like industrial stuff. Right, right. And, and yes, I see, I don't shoot anything that's not people. Yeah. Um, I at least need it to be people. Um, <laughs> just because it's so, I mean, it's okay. I'll, I would do it, but it's just a lot of that work hasn't come up and I haven't really gone after it because I haven't really cared. I'm, I'm more interested in people um, and, the, and the portrait, I guess, so. Mm -hmm. So, how would you dis describe your style? Um, ever changing, and I think everybody's style should be ever changing. But the I think the more mature my work gets, the more that it, the more consistent it gets, or that look gets. And I think that I honestly feel like I just kind of landed on something I'm happy with after seven or eight years of yeah. doing it. I'm like, oh, okay, I had a style earlier, um, but. I've kind of now just shifted into like a second main theme of a style just within the past year or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think it always should be changing. You should be reevaluating, seeing where you want to go. Um, but right now, currently, I would describe my style as maybe emotion driven. Um, I do care about light and lighting and what the technical aspect of things, uh, but I, I'm... 
I want to get that there first, but I'm more concerned with uh, seeing some kind of level of communication and emotion between people, um, whether it's a, a father crying or hugging his daughter or uh, people uh, getting together. Because that's what matters, I think, to me most. I just was recently married and, uh, you know, in looking for a photographer, I, I wanted to see some emotion, you know, in connection there because that's what I want to see. You know, because I'm an emotional guy as a as a musician, photographer, artist kind of kind of guy, and uh, I I think that you know in the old days it was you know as a guy you really didn't want to show any emotion, but now it's a little it's more socially acceptable, and and I don't really care. I, I enjoy life more, um, you know, having a little emotion, and I'm okay with having it being seen in photos, you know. So did you cry more than her? That's what. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I might have. Because I did more. at my wedding. Yeah. <laughs> she was just laughing at me at the altar. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> right. So. Yeah. So how did you choose your own photographer? I mean, I kind of you told me kind of. Yeah. So I, as far as choosing a photographer for my wedding, uh, I just basically uh, knew that I wanted to hire somebody outside of our area uh, to have the experience of hiring somebody. Because everybody in, in our area I pretty much know. And I think I'm better informed for having a uh, search for a photographer outside of our area uh, than just choosing somebody I know or something like that. And the thing with, if I did choose somebody I know, I also, you know, there's a networking aspect to the way that things work. And I want to make sure that, um, that my photographer friends could attend the wedding and, as well. Yeah. So it's kind of a, all that stuff bunched up. I think that just was the right decision. I'm glad I made the decision. And, I'm, and I know from watching them work, I was very happy with what, what they were doing. And I know the work's going to be really great when, when we get it. So. I'll just give them a couple of months. You know. Yeah, I know. That's the thing. Yeah, it'll, it'll be a while. But that's, you know, I, I, you know, I know how long it takes, you know, to effectively edit a wedding, especially when you have a lot, a lot of bookings. So um, we'll be patient. So cool. Mm -hmm. um, anything like, like where you want, I mean, you said that the podcast is kind of like something where it's like you're looking towards the future, what you eventually maybe gonna do or like you're doing this workshop in Syracuse on, on May 6th um, so is there something like the teaching photography is that something you might want to evolve in eventually yeah, I guess I guess that's what I was kind of alluding to it when I said um, when I'm 60 do I want to be rolling around on a church floor um, and like I said I'm fine rolling around on a church floor it's fine but I, I would like to I'm a teacher I used to be a teacher and I think that I'm pretty decent at it and I would like to kind of um, you know, transition into more teaching and workshops as things go along. I'm not really interested in that right right now. If it happens, um, like this workshop, um, this May 6th workshop, which May 6th, if this is out there, or May 6th, I'm doing a workshop in Syracuse. Um, but uh, that somebody approached me, so I'm not I'm not necessarily going out and trying to yeah. book workshops. But I've always said if somebody approaches me and wants me to do one. Um, then fine, and I've you know I've done a number of things like that and had a number of interns yeah. because people have approached me. I'm not necessarily seeking it out. At some point, um, I probably will seek it out, um, but that's maybe five to ten years down the road. And but and I kind of view myself as kind of like the, with the podcast and stuff, just kind of setting myself up for that, mm -hmm. you know, when the time comes. So, cool. yeah. Um. How would you describe like your ideal client? Like who do you want to work with? Yeah, so an ideal client is somebody that really, uh, number one, has to look at my work and love it. Uh, that's, I think, the most important thing that I want out of a client is they have to look at it and love it. And then I'll respect me as an artist to be able to do my thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always going to get the family shots and the traditional shots and the things that people care about. I always put myself in the shoes of my clients at the end of the day. Um, so I'm always going to do that. And I really just hope that and, and ask, and sometimes I'm even almost this forward with clients when I'm meeting with them for the first time that I expect that they are going to trust me to do that. Um, because if they don't, it becomes much harder to shoot. And then you, I, you end up second guessing your, yourself and the clients will come up with these lists of um, different photos that they want. And, and the more that they do that, um, the the harder it is to actually get those shots that would become pincer shots. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I, you know, I always try to express that to the, to the clients earlier in the meetings. And, and when I was younger, I was afraid to do that. And now that I'm more mature, I feel, I feel like they respect me more that I actually say that and I'm kind of upfront about that. And then the wedding goes better for everybody, for them, for me, everybody. And sometimes you get people that are still a little bit more type A and, you know, but, and it's gonna be what it's gonna be, yeah. but at least trying to hone in on that, I think um, helps everybody. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, I had a, I talked to a couple on Skype out of Chicago on Sunday who wanted like just their ceremony like, like filmed. Yeah. So, they were like super about like, okay, can we just do like one hour? And then um, like, would you charge us for the setup time? Right. I was like, what is going on? <laughs> I was like, okay, first of all, we're gonna do a minimum. I mean, it's a Friday, so I'm okay with just going there for like at least two hours though. Yeah. So do two or three hours, it's gonna be like the better overall video. And then they were like, okay, what about, um, what about sound? So how do you deal with like um, audio shooting outside? I was like, well, I just, you know, give a, microphone to the groom, mm. and this is what it looks like. Uh, it's like, because they were like really asking about it, so I was like, hey, this is what it looks like, it's super tiny, you won't see it. Yeah, we just don't want it to see in the photos. I was like, well, like, I never had any complaints. Yeah. Like, anybody, because it's the same what we're wearing right now. It's yeah. like, it's not super bad, and it's just like part of the event. I, I told them, well, it's, it's the same as if I'm filming your first dance, and then the photographer's shooting flash the entire time, you will see in the video there's flash going off, but that's just part of the event. That's just how it goes. Right. And they were like super weird about everything. So I, I honestly hope that they are. <laughs> yeah. And, and I've had meetings like that too. And sometimes uh, I usually entertain people when they start asking those questions. And I've actually had some really interesting client meetings like that, yeah. like over Skype, um, where you know one guy was asking me what camera I use, what lenses yeah. I use you know, what my settings are at a particular point of the day and all this kind of stuff. And I kind of entertained him a little bit, yeah. but I was also honest with him and said, here's, here's the reason, you know, I'll answer the question, but honestly, and if it's how you talk to people. So if I, yeah. if I say, but here's really the reason that you really don't want to be asking that question and then laugh about it, yeah. you know, and, and, I, and are, are jolly about it, right? I think yeah. you're going to get a different response back. Um, and they'll actually, then they'll actually question, well, you know what, he, he's probably right, maybe I don't need to be asking this question. But some people don't really get the communication aspect of it, yeah. and they become negative right away, and then it ends up being a bad conversation. So, it, but I ended up booking that wedding. I've had other weird meetings like that, and then it ends up being totally fine. Or I've had people ask me for the raw files on the initial meeting, and I say, Oh, you know, if you really want them, you know, that's fine. And, you know, like you, I'll let you know after the wedding, but 95% of the people don't. And, you know, but I'll give you the option if you want it. And, yeah. pe and they, they book me. And then through working with me, they're like, oh, he knows what he's doing. Everything's going to be fine. And they don't, none of that stuff comes up later. So yeah. sometimes you have to kind of get through that initial stuff. And there's that educational component, but it's, it's how you talk to people um, that, uh, you know, that, that matters there for getting past that, that yeah, stuff. Definitely. I mean, yeah, I try to explain to them in a way that, you know, that I'm pretty much just giving my recommendation. And if I say you need that microphone, they should trust me in a way. Right. Um, but they were like, didn't really feel right. <laughs> that was accurate. Yeah. And just the fact like, you know, if, if somebody wants to hire you for one hour and then also just like ask you about the setup time, which is like, I said, that's like 15 minutes. So right. like, what are you talking about? Yeah. I don't know, but that's, that's just some, some stuff that happens. And it, it probably has a lot to do with people have never hired photographer or videographer right. before. Yep. So that's kind of, they have no idea. So they look up question lists on the internet and then they, it comes up. Cool. Uh, I think that's it, unless you want to say anything else. No, that's it. Good. Yeah. Thanks for having me by. Good luck with, your, uh, with the rest of your show here and, yeah. and, uh, and good luck. Thanks for having me.